Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Selena and Alberto met through mutual friends. There was an instant attraction between them, a fact that quickly became evident to all. After that party, the young couple started dating and discovered they shared many common interests, favorite movies, books, and even views on life. They found comfort and contentment in each other's company. Alberto often told his beloved how grateful he was for their serendipitous meeting. Selena felt the same way. This charming, somewhat shy guy quickly became the most important person in her world. At the time they met, both had recently graduated from university. Selena became a primary school teacher, while Alberto, having earned an engineering degree, found work in a factory. Throughout his student years, he had always juggled jobs working as a courier, a car washer, a cafe waiter. He hustled however he could. Coming from a modest family, he understood the need to earn his own way if he wanted to complete his university education. From an early age, Alberto had dreamed of higher education. His stepfather had been a hardworking construction worker, and his mother, having only completed secondary school, worked intermittently as a cleaner. Alberto resolved early on to reach greater heights, earn a professional degree, and build a career. He pursued his goals relentlessly. Selena was raised solely by her mother, so she too hadn't experienced a life of luxury or excess in her childhood. Her mother's nurse salary covered only the essentials. However, unlike her husband, Selena had a wonderful relationship with her mother. Her mother always understood and supported her. When Selena was at university, her mother took on extra work to ensure her daughter wasn't distracted from her studies. The thought of Selena working during this time never crossed her mother's mind. She will bear the burden of work soon enough, her mother reasoned, let her childhood extend a bit longer. Alberto was reluctant to speak of his early years. Selena learned that his mother had a serious drinking problem, frequently changing partners, and virtually neglected him. Apparently, young Alberto was nearly sent to an orphanage, but then his mother somehow came to her senses and sobered up. She met a worthy man, Alberto's stepfather, who helped her overcome her destructive habit. Life became significantly easier. But Alberto harbored some resentment towards his mother. He didn't speak of it, but Selena, sensitive as she was, noticed. Initially, she tried to inquire about his past. She needed to know what had happened to him. Selena suspected some psychological trauma was at play. She dearly wanted to help him cope with it, but Alberto skillfully evaded such discussions either by changing the subject, making light of it, or simply dismissing her queries or pretending not to hear them. Eventually, Selena ceased her attempts. When the time was right, he would tell her himself. She couldn't influence his past, but she could certainly strive to make Alberto's present and future happy and joyful. That was something she knew she could do. When Alberto asked her to be his wife, Selena didn't hesitate with her answer, of course, yes. She could no longer imagine her life with anyone else. Her mother, however, wasn't very pleased with her daughter's choice. I did not dream of such a husband for you, not at all. Her mother shook her head when Selena shared the joyous news. You're beautiful, educated, and practical. You could have married someone more prosperous. And what is Alberto? Yes, he's hardworking and loves you, but he has nothing. And his family is poor. His mother's a drinker. And jeans, you know, can show up in children. You'll end up living paycheck to paycheck all your life, always in debt. Mother, I am so happy with him. We love each other. Yes, you love each other. I know, I see it. But love alone won't get you far. However, it's your life, and you're an adult now. It's your decision to make. But what decision was there to make? Selena had already decided long ago. They had a wedding, modest, but merry and heartfelt. Only close relatives and friends were present. They had to economize on everything, but Alberto's savings were enough, and they managed to avoid debt. Selena was willing to forego the celebration altogether. They could have had a quiet marriage without a ceremony and saved the money. 
It would be better for a young couple to have some extra. But Alberto wanted to please his beloved and earn her mother's blessing, who once mentioned dreaming of seeing her daughter in a white wedding dress, looking like a princess. So, Alberto did his best to make that dream come true. The young married couple began their lives together in a rented apartment. Both were employed, sharing household chores equitably, never bothering with tallies or lists. Whoever had the free time would prepare dinner, clean up, and so on. A perfect understanding reigned between them. They seldom argued, always finding the right words to communicate without insults or offenses. Together, they were content, feeling psychologically comfortable, warm, and cozy. The years passed by, and before they knew it, seven years had flown since their wedding day. Everything in their lives was splendid. Their relationship hadn't lost its sincerity or warmth. In fact, through the years of marital life, Alberto and Selena grew closer, learning to understand each other without words. It was truly marvelous. Even better, they had managed to secure a mortgage, finally purchasing their own apartment, a two-bedroom, in a not-so-prestigious district, but it was theirs. With love and attention to each detail, they renovated their nest, furnishing it exactly as they liked. They allocated one room as a living room come bedroom, while the second, the most spacious and cozy, was reserved for their future child. They planned to transform it into a beautiful nursery. But the years kept passing, and the much-awaited pregnancy didn't occur. At first, they hadn't planned for a child and took preventative measures. The timing wasn't right, they had insufficient funds, were renting, and both were working full days. But then their financial situation improved, they had their own place, and both decided it was time. Selena never thought it would be so difficult. It seemed straightforward, want a baby, stop taking the pill, and within the next month, you are pregnant. But in reality, it turned out to be far different. At first, the negative pregnancy tests didn't bother her too much, but one year passed, then a second, and still no sign of the coveted pregnancy. Every month, as she saw the single line on the test, Selena would cry. She desperately yearned to experience motherhood, to offer a little person her love and care. Alberto, too, dreamed of offspring. Of course, he pretended everything was okay. Why the rush? We're still young. But Selena saw the way he looked at their friend's children. Alberto loved interacting with boys and girls of all ages. He knew how to approach each one. She understood that her husband would make a wonderful father. But they still couldn't have a child. This led them to consult numerous doctors. Selena was diagnosed with health issues that were causing infertility. The day Selena learned about her diagnosis, she barely made it home. Her eyes were blinded by tears, her head was buzzing. It was all very, very serious, her chances of becoming a mother were incredibly slim. Selena felt guilty and unworthy of Alberto. Had he chosen a different wife, he would have long been cradling his long-awaited heirs. And now what? A long treatment and an uncertain future. What's with the long face, he said, wrapping his arms around her shoulders. The main thing is that we've found the cause. Now we'll undergo treatment, and it will work out, you'll see. The treatment required a lot of strength, time, and money. The majority of both their salaries were now spent on costly medication and procedures. Selena had to frequently visit clinics, endure pain, and stick to strict diets. Alberto supported his wife as best he could. I'm sorry that you have to go through all of this, he said one day. I can see how this treatment is affecting you. You're barely recognizable. Selena knew her husband was right. She had lost weight, constantly felt nervous and irritable. Her constant companions were exhaustion and despair and hope, which was fading with each passing month. Initially, Selena believed that the treatment would bring quick results. She was doing everything the doctors said, strictly following their instructions. But as time went by, nothing changed. Each month brought more disappointment. Heavy thoughts plagued her. Why was this happening to them? Everyone around them seemed to have children easily, even those who were, in truth, not worthy of them. Take Alberto's mother, for example. 
She may have composed herself now, but in the past, she drank, changed partners. The traces of that life were permanently etched in her face. Yet, she gave birth to a wonderful healthy son, whom she neglected for a long time. And there were many other such examples. So why couldn't a child appear in their family, where the spouses loved and respected each other so deeply? It hurt Selena to walk past windows displaying children's goods. She barely communicated with friends who had children, and upon seeing a joyful mother with a stroller on the street, she would hurry to cross to the other side. When, after three years of intensive treatment, Selena still had not become pregnant, the doctor suggested IVF. As it turned out, he had already put her on a waiting list, but had forgotten to inform her, and now it was time. The procedure itself was paid for from the budget, they only needed to purchase some medications. This was very timely, as there was no spare money in the family. Everything they had managed to save was spent on the treatment that had not yielded results. The proposal for IVF came as a surprise, but Selena didn't hesitate for a moment. Yes, she was fully aware of all the health risks, but she didn't care as long as the long-awaited child arrived in their apartment and the room prepared for the baby finally ceased to be empty. The once-dimmed hope raised its head, revived. For the first time in a long time, the woman felt a surge of energy and enthusiasm. Selena thought that her husband would rejoice at the news, but he took it without any particular enthusiasm. You do realize this is a serious harm to your health. A horse's dose of hormones is not vitamins. The consequences could be disastrous, and nobody can guarantee the result. Don't say things like that. Selena exclaimed. There will be a result. There certainly will be. I can feel it. Maybe. Maybe we should abandon this treatment, since it's not working out. Let's adopt a child from the orphanage. There are so many abandoned ones. What? Selena choked on her indignation. Between her and Alberto, there had always been harmony. Usually, he understood her without even words. How could her husband suggest such a thing to take in someone else's child when they might have their own, so beloved, so long awaited? Why are you so critical of this? Alberto's tone was calm and conciliatory. I've been thinking about it for a long time, I just haven't told you. It hurts to watch how you suffer. But we haven't even tried all the methods yet. Selena retorted. It took a lot of effort for her not to shout at her uncomprehending husband. Are you listening to what I'm telling you or not? We've been given the opportunity to have the IVF procedure for free. How could I miss such a chance? It's a torture to your health. Well, so be it. I am ready for it for the sake of a baby, for our own baby. Why do we need someone else's? Children in orphanages are only children of alcoholics, future criminals. Genes are a terrible force. Nothing good comes out of such children. I almost ended up in an orphanage once, Alberto quietly uttered. His eyes filled with sadness, as they always did when he recalled his childhood years. Those were tough times for him. Selena felt a pang of guilt. She knew this story. Back then, Alberto's mother had hit rock bottom. She was jobless and had fallen into the pit of heavy drinking. The child was virtually fed by scraps and the kind-hearted neighbor's charity. Alberto was about five or six years old at that time, a mere tot. Of course, people around knew that the boy was in danger. Someone had called Child Protective Services. Luckily, Alberto's mother was in a sober state during their visit, but her lifestyle's peculiarities were evident even to the untrained eye. A maternal instinct ignited within her. She managed to keep her son, to fight for him to stay in the family. She even got a job to ensure this. And maybe it would have been better if I had ended up in the orphanage, Alberto mused when he first told his wife about this episode of his life. Child Protective Services began visiting their tiny room frequently for checks. The mother understood she was under constant surveillance, and hence she maintained a respectable living. She cleaned, cooked some simple food, and worked. She found a job as a janitor. Then she met a man and fell in love. 
They moved to a different city with little Alberto, where she returned to her old habits of drinking. Alberto's mother wasn't a good mother for long. I could have ended up in an orphanage, Alberto said, looking into his wife's eyes, but I wouldn't have turned into a criminal or a marginal. Of course, you wouldn't have, Selena smiled at him. You're a very good person, the best and kindest, much kinder than me, since you're ready to take in someone else's child and raise him as your own. I can't do that, understand. I understand and I won't press you. But still, think about the IVF. Why do you need to ruin your health? After all, we can also live for ourselves if push comes to shove. There are people who live without children. But to such a life, Selena was absolutely unprepared. She would become a mother, period, and no trials were frightening to her. IVF harms health? That's all right, she would recover, if only to hear the long-awaited mommy from a little person. For the first time, they transferred two embryos to Selena. After the procedure, she carried herself as if she were a glass vase, carefully and gently. Her face was lit up with a happy smile. The woman dreamed that both would implant, then they would have twins, a boy and a girl. It would be a real miracle. Selena was already mentally planning the nursery for her daughter and son, picturing where she would place the cribs, where the changing table would go. The challenges associated with caring for two infants at once didn't scare her. She had waited so long for a child, so these troubles would be a joy to her. For ten days, Alberto and Selena lived in a state of expectancy. Alberto wouldn't allow his wife to do anything around the house. He cooked, cleaned, and tried to buoy his beloved spirits with good news. All the while, Selena would listen to her body, trying to detect the early signs of pregnancy. After years of planning, she had combed through many related websites and knew well what a woman at the early stages should feel. And signs were indeed there. Her stomach pulled and tingled, her food cravings changed, and a ravenous appetite emerged. Selena was eagerly awaiting the onset of morning sickness. This clear symptom, usually causing women much discomfort, would make her the happiest woman in the world. But it was still too early for that. Of course, Selena couldn't resist and started doing pregnancy tests long before the due date. Yet, they consistently showed only one line. Hoping to see a faint second line, she examined the tests for a long time. All Alberto could do was sigh, watching this unfold. Soon it became evident it hadn't worked. Despair washed over Selena. She had never experienced such disappointment. She had harbored so much hope for the IVF procedure. She cried into her pillow at night, thinking that Alberto wouldn't see. But he noticed everything. He was hurting too. He worried for his wife and had no idea how to help her. This feeling of helplessness weighed heavily on him. The doctor tried to reassure them, saying that it really works on the first try, so they attempted again after a month. However, this too didn't yield a result. Then Selena underwent the procedure a third time, then a fourth. By the fifth time, the woman was almost devoid of hope, but she still sobbed over yet another negative test. The doctor told her that her body now needed to rest, and then they could start a new protocol. For some people, it only works on the eighth or ninth attempt. No, said Alberto, when Selena told him about her visit to the clinic. You won't torture yourself anymore. Let's take a break. This time, the woman didn't argue. She felt drained, both mentally and physically. Her emotional resources were exhausted. She wouldn't have been able to bear another disappointment, and she knew this well. Alberto was right. They needed to take a break, distract themselves, do something else. After all, for the past few years, all her thoughts and actions had been devoted to one goal, the birth of a baby. Selena had forgotten that life wasn't limited to this alone. She couldn't even remember the last time she read something other than books on the subject of reproduction. Alberto no longer initiated conversations about adopting a child from an orphanage, but Selena herself began to contemplate this possibility more frequently. The hopes for their own little one were fading, while the need to shower a tiny creature with care and attention was growing. After all, not all orphans were the progeny of alcoholics. 
Even if their biological parents weren't fortunate, much would still depend on their upbringing. For instance, her husband, her beloved Alberto, the kindest and most decent man on earth, almost ended up in an orphanage himself. Surely, there must be many good-hearted children in these places. She hadn't even tried looking. Thus, it gradually became a habit for Selena to sift through the profiles of orphans. She hadn't made any firm decisions yet. She hadn't even discussed anything with her husband. But the topic suddenly sparked her interest. Her emotions when viewing the photographs of abandoned children were conflicted. She pitied these little ones who had been dealt such an unfortunate hand early in life. However, the idea of bringing one of these children into their family also frightened her. Many had serious medical diagnoses written across their faces and most had several siblings. They could only be adopted or fostered together. They were not separated. It was just, but Selena was not prepared to receive two adolescent brothers in addition to a tiny adorable girl with blue eyes. Selena very much wanted a daughter, a sweet girl with braids that she could dress up in beautiful dresses. She would buy her dolls. They would become real friends. And daughters, they say, are usually more affectionate and attentive to their parents. Alberto also dreamed of becoming a father to a girl. At the beginning of their planning journey, when happiness seemed just around the corner, he mentioned this several times. He said he would be her protector and shield, even promising to learn how to iron dresses and do girlish hairstyles. It was very touching. All of Selena's male friends dreamed of sons while her Alberto was waiting for a daughter. Yes, he would have been an ideal father for their little princess. But it didn't happen, it didn't come true. And it's unlikely to happen now. Perhaps because of her dream of a daughter, Selena paid more attention to the profiles of orphan girls. Some of them were even very pretty, but they were strangers. Selena didn't feel even a hint of warmth when she looked at these photos and videos. Pity, yes, a desire to become a mother to one of these little ones, no. But once she became interested in this topic, Selena continued to methodically review the profiles. Gradually, she came to the realization that she might have to live out her life without children. Having one of their own was not working out, and adoption, it seemed, was not for her. It was regrettable, painful, sad, but what could be done? It happens. An example was Selena's own aunt. She lived her entire life for herself, did not stress, traveled to resorts, had romances. In the end, she married a foreigner and moved to Australia. Once again, a beautiful, carefree life. The man had grown children. They accepted their father's wife as their own. Selena couldn't remember a time when her aunt regretted not having a child of her own. On the contrary, she sympathized with her sister, Selena's mother, who had to single-handedly raise a daughter. Selena certainly hadn't planned on going to Australia, but she began to construct future plans that didn't center around children. The long empty room was overdue for a makeover into a home gym. Now she and Alberto would be able to keep fit together. And she was definitely not participating in the new IVF protocol anymore. It had already ruffled her nervous system with vain hopes and probably damaged her health. No more, enough was enough. Or maybe later, definitely not within the next five years at least. On that day, Selena sat in the vacant classroom, sipping her coffee. She had a little window of time. Her third graders had gone for physical education. The woman decided to seize this moment to take a breather and unwind. She didn't feel like checking notebooks. She'd get to that later. Her mind was at ease as she scrolled through advertisements for creams and the selection in her favorite online shops. Then, the search engine threw her a couple of orphan profiles. New portfolios had appeared on one of the most popular websites, featuring children in need of a family. Out of habit, Selena scanned the profiles of two girls, small and relatively healthy. But, they were strangers, completely unfamiliar. Almost mechanically, the woman moved onto the page of a new little boy, enlarged his photo, and froze. A six-year-old child who bore a striking resemblance to Alberto was staring back at her. 
The same large gray-green eyes, the same slightly upturned nose, stubbornly clenched lips, a strong-willed chin, and the hair, unruly chestnut hair. Selena continued to steady the child. Impossible. He even had a birthmark on his neck identical to her husband's. What a coincidence. Selena had always dreamt of a daughter. She didn't even consider boys' profiles, but this lad immediately stole her heart. She felt something special, a mix of sympathy, warmth, and tenderness. After all, Alberto could have ended up in an orphanage just like this Domingo Savliev and at roughly the same age too. Probably, a six-year-old Alberto looked exactly like this boy. Her heart felt a tug. Selena examined Domingo's details more closely. The child was healthy, with no siblings. According to the description, he was a clever and curious kid, which was evident even from his gaze. Over the years of working with primary school kids, Selena had become adept at understanding children, and Domingo was clearly among the smart and active ones. The woman tore her gaze away from the screen, lost in thought. She had almost come to terms with the idea of never being a mother, and so had Alberto. And now Domingo. It felt so strange. She had looked through countless pictures of abandoned children, and none of them stirred such feelings in her. Selena made up her mind. She dialed the number of the orphanage where Domingo was living. It turned out that the institution was in a neighboring city. They told her that the boy hadn't been adopted yet. He was virtually healthy, just very anxious. His mother, a former orphanage ward herself, had died in an accident. They had no relatives. That's how the child ended up with them. Such problem-free children don't usually stay long with adoptive parents line up for them. Therefore, the orphanage director advised Selena to swiftly prepare all necessary documents and complete adoptive parents' training, otherwise someone else might beat them to it. Selena hung up the phone. They now had so much to do, and they needed to act fast. She didn't even want to think about the possibility that someone else might adopt Domingo. He was their son. He was the spitting image of Alberto. Something told her that the boy had the same nature too, kind, understanding, and reliable. They needed to hurry. Alberto was working on yet another report when his wife called. As soon as he heard her excited voice on the line, he knew something was up. Alberto, I have news for you. Wonderful news. I think we're going to have a son. You, are you pregnant? No. I found a boy's profile in an orphan database, and he looks just like you. This child will live with us. You'll like him too, you'll see. Wait, I don't understand. You didn't want someone else's child. But he's not someone else's. He's ours. Ours. You'll see for yourself and understand. You're not against it, are you? Of course not, assured Alberto. He had suggested this option to his wife several times before, but she had categorically refused. Now this was a surprise. It's just so sudden. I need to get used to the idea. You have until tonight to get used to it. After that, we have a ton of things to do. We need to go through foster parent training, gather a whole package of documents. By the way, pick up a salary certificate from your workplace today. All right. Of course. Alberto ended the call and pondered. He was unequivocally happy about his wife's decision. Finally, they were going to have a child. They were going to become parents. It was wonderful. But the man wanted to take the child from the orphanage, not just to fulfill parental instincts. He had an unpaid debt, a promise he couldn't keep. This act could partially atone for his guilt toward his sister. Alberto had never told anyone about Angela, not even Selena. It was too hard. He tried to forget everything that had happened to him many years ago in his distant childhood. Sometimes he succeeded, everyday worries distracted him, work occupied all his thoughts. But sometimes the memories overwhelmed him with unbearable heaviness. Angela, his little sister, the closest and most dear person in the world. Where was she now? Angelo was two years older than Alberto. 
At the time when everything happened, she was almost seven. Their mother had completely lost her humanity then, incessantly drinking, bringing crowds of friends, fellow lovers of liquor, into their tiny dormitory room. She didn't care about her children at all. They were living on scraps. Given that it was winter, it was a tough time. Kind-hearted neighbors, of course, fed the little ones. They also collected bottles, which were left in abundance after the mother's boozy gatherings, and sold them for a few pennies. Sometimes, one of the men who regularly hung around their place would give them a few bills. That was their life. Angelo was supposed to start first grade the following year. She was eagerly awaiting it. She wanted to learn, wear a beautiful uniform, interact with her peers. For Alberto, his sister was everything, protection, support, comfort. He felt that she was the only person in the world who genuinely loved him, and he reciprocated Angela's feelings. The children shared everything they managed to get, bread, candy, milk. Their life was fraught with dangers, so both always remained vigilant. They even slept lightly, jolting up at the slightest suspicious sound. After all, they had had to fend for themselves on numerous occasions, despite their tender age. Once, one of their mother's friends almost set their room on fire. Another time, a drinking companion started a brawl. Such things happened often, and the children regularly witnessed the fights. But this time, the man crossed all imaginable boundaries. With wild eyes, he swung his fists, not caring who was in front of him. Angela then dragged her sleepy younger brother to their neighbors. That's where they spent the rest of the night. The neighbors. Angela and Alberto had seen many, as their mother often moved, dragging the children with her. People reacted differently to their small family. Some looked at the fallen woman with two small children with disgust. Some pitied them and helped in any way they could, with clothes, food, a kind word. Some called the brother and sister homeless and marginalized outright. The most dangerous were the children. Angela and Alberto felt like outsiders. Usually, kids from normal families didn't let them join their games, but being ignored wasn't the worst. In every place, there was a group of boys and girls who knew that there was no one to protect them and did whatever they wanted. Angela and Alberto were often pushed into the mud, pelted with stones and dirt, and even had chewing gum rubbed into their hair. As Alberto got a little older, he tried to defend Angela, but his strength was simply not enough to confront the older antagonists. Each time they had an encounter with these young beasts, Angela would cry. Alberto would console her, stroking her hair. He would tell her that everything was going to be all right. He promised that he would grow up, become strong and wealthy, and then no one would dare to lay a finger on them. Through her tears, Angela would smile and gently shake her head. She always found solace quickly when she was with her brother. But as Alberto later understood, his sister knew that the life scenario he had concocted was impossible. After all, she was two full years older and had a better grasp of reality. As an adult, Alberto realized that Angela had likely possessed a unique talent. She had an amazing knack for creating stories. And how smoothly and eloquently she crafted them. Back then, Alberto took it for granted. But now, as a grown man, he marveled at where such skill could have come from, considering their mother never once read a book to them. Where did she get her inspiration? How did her brilliant little mind give birth to these incredible narratives? And the crucial question, had Angela grown up in a loving family, what heights might she have reached as a writer? Alberto believed his sister could have been a great success. Ah, the subjunctive mood. It was best not to dwell on such things, or else his anger towards their mother would rise again. She preferred to party and live off the generosity of her alcoholic suitors rather than work and take care of her children. She saw no other way of life for herself. She was indifferent to the fact that her son and daughter regularly faced danger, wandering without supervision. She did not care whether they were fed or clothed. This lifestyle suited her just fine. And the children, knowing no other life, didn't complain about their fate and accepted it as the norm. Such families still exist today, but now they attract more attention and child protective services intervene. But back then, it was different. 
the fate of two small children interested no one. Angela and Alberto had no toys, no books, so one of Alberto's most cherished pastimes was listening to the stories his sister made up on the spot. She told amazing tales about various characters, a lively button, a puppy named Tobik, a sad little chick. But his favorite were the stories about a boy named Luchik and a girl named Smashinka, who lived in a wonderful kingdom on a cloud. Angela would point out which cloud they lived on, and they would always have exciting adventures. Sometimes they would be escaping from a fearsome giant, other times they would find themselves in an enchanted forest, or they would journey to the bottom of the sea to visit the king of all the oceans. Each time, Angela came up with something interesting and captivating. Alberto would listen, his mouth agape in wonder. His sister knew how to tell stories in such a way that she constantly kept her sole listener in suspense. Sometimes she would abruptly cut off the story at the most exciting part, leaving her brother eagerly awaiting the next installment. Now, reflecting on those stories, a smile would light up Alberto's face, yet the emotions that stirred within him were mixed. On one hand, he felt a warm and cozy sense of nostalgia, but on the other, an unsettling worry would clench his heart. How was his older sister doing? What had happened to Angela since they parted ways? Was her life going well? He wanted to believe that Angela's life had turned out for the best. Someone as radiant and pure as her deserved no less. The girl had an enchanting smile, a gentle gaze, and a kind heart that could captivate anyone around her. Alberto had noticed this even when he was just five. He could only hope that Angela now had a loving family that cared for her. Oh, Angela, it was a shame that he had lost track of her. Alberto would have given a lot to reunite with his sister. That January, their mother brought an unfamiliar man into their rented room. This wasn't a surprise. The children were used to constantly seeing new faces. Alberto scrutinized Camillo carefully. At his tender age of five, he had already learned to discern people's characters, to understand what he could expect from these guests, indifference, aggression, pity, attention. Camillo struck him as different at first sight, serious, even stern, resolute, and overly attentive. He promptly expelled all of their mother's friends, then organized a thorough cleanup of the room, employing everyone, children included. Their mother watched him with devoted eyes, obeying him in everything. She even began to drink less, only allowing herself a bit with her new companion on weekends. Camillo worked a shift job. He had an apartment in another city, which was where he intended to move his mistress and her children. Though he was still a young boy, Alberto understood that their lives were about to change dramatically. It appeared that their mother was going to marry Camillo, or at least, that's what he had gathered from the adults' conversations. Did this mean that he and Angela were about to gain a father? Life became materially easier. Camillo earned a decent wage and there was enough money for food. Their mother began to cook. Camillo demanded proper meals. The children were never hungry now, and the stale odor of alcohol was replaced by the aroma of borscht and pies. However, Camillo was very strict, scolding the children for any misstep and blaming their mother for spoiling them. The children tried their best to please the man, but he always found something to complain about. Not even Angela's charming smile, which usually melted the hardest hearts, could soften him. What did Camillo see in their mother that he decided to share his life with a woman of such social misbehavior and two children? Looking back, Alberto assumed that others could not withstand Camillo's despotic nature. For their mother, Camillo was almost a deity, a homeowner, a shift worker with a high salary. She was ready to tolerate anything to be by his side. One day, Camillo took it upon himself to teach Angela how to read. You're almost seven years old. Many kids your age are in school, and yet you still can't read, he reproached the girl when he discovered the gaps in her education. She simply lowered her head, feeling guilty. Alberto longed to embrace his sister, to offer her support, but Camillo drove the boy away. Stop interfering. We're going to study letters now. The process was painstaking. Usually quick-witted, grasping everything on the fly, Angela simply couldn't memorize the letters. Camillo became angry, calling her stupid. 
This only caused the girl to retreat further into herself and stopped her from understanding her tutor at all. The lessons usually ended with Camillo flinging the primer away in frustration and sending the girl away, often after giving her a smack or a clout. Alberto hated him for this. He helplessly clenched his small fists and threw angry glances at Camillo. This sometimes earned him a beating as well. Alberto would comfort his sister, stroke her arms and hair, and wipe away her tears. She sobbed in her little brother's arms and clung to him, her body shaking from crying. The boy wished he could be a reliable shield for her, a stone wall. But what could he do at the age of five? And Alberto too wept out of powerlessness and resentment. She's just stupid. Camillo often told their mother about Angela. She's mentally retarded. Have you shown the girl to doctors? We haven't been to the clinic for a long time, the mother admitted. But she might be as dumb as her father, that's for sure. Soon school starts, I'll have a hard time with her. What school for her? Even the boy has memorized these letters, though I wasn't specifically teaching him. He just listened, hung around. But the girl, she just can't. She's backward, that's certain. She needs serious treatment. And indeed, Alberto had memorized the letters. He tried to stay close to his sister during Camillo's lessons so that she could feel his support and be less scared, and of course, he also listened to his stepfather's explanations. Meanwhile, Angela sat next to the teacher, tense and frightened, and thus could not absorb the knowledge the man painstakingly tried to hammer into her head. Stress The girl was experiencing immense stress next to this alien, aggressive man. He yelled, called her a fool, might suddenly hit her. In such a state, the child clearly wasn't up for reading. A talented and astute girl was unable to remember a single letter out of sheer fear, which only angered her stepfather even more. He would shout at her again and again, even beating her. It was a vicious circle. Angela's birthday was approaching. The family didn't make a habit of throwing parties for the children. The siblings would have remained ignorant about the upcoming event if it hadn't been for Camillo. On February 20th, the girl will be seven, he said. Her birthday is on the 20th, right? She needs to go through a school commission. They will diagnose her there. Upon hearing this, Alberto understood. Here was something that would make his sister happy. He would throw her a party, give her a gift on her birthday. The boy had often seen and heard of the festivities other children had. He and his sister never had that, but this year he would give Angela a pleasant surprise. He would give her a miracle and, perhaps, finally see her smile again. Lately, she had been unusually sad, all because of the hateful Camillo. Things were better without him, even if not as well off. It would have been better if their mother had never met him. And so, little Alberto said about his preparations. First, he needed to secure a gift and, on top of that, find some money for a cake. Old habits die hard, and the boy ventured to the nearest trash cans where one could always find empty bottles. That day, luck was on his side. He hit the jackpot. At the recycling center, he made enough money not for an entire cake, but enough to buy his sister a beautiful, mouth-watering pastry with a cherry on top, just like in cartoons. Now he just had to find a gift. Alberto knew exactly where to go, to the local toy store. Its windows always beckoned with vibrant, colorful items, long-haired, beautiful dolls, smiling teddy bears, and multicolored toy cars. He and his sister often spent a long time peering in at all this magnificence from the street, never daring to step inside. Any money they ever had went straight towards food. But today was different. As awful as Camillo was, Angela and Alberto no longer had to worry about hunger. With the remainder of the money from the bottle refund, Alberto decided to buy his sister the most beautiful doll. Angela had never had one. Alberto had often noticed the sad look in his sister's eyes as she watched other girls playing with their dolls. Inside the store, it was warm and cozy. It was especially pleasant to be there after wandering through the February chill. The abundance of magnificent toys made Alberto's head spin. Then he saw her, the beautiful doll, the one he was sure would delight Angela. 
The doll was dressed in a long, flowing sky blue dress. The boy could imagine his sister's joy at seeing this princess, and his heart began to flutter. At the cash register, the little boy was disappointed. The doll was too expensive. Seeing the boy's tears, the shopkeeper decided to help. She asked him how much money he had and led the young customer to another section situated in the back of the store. Here, the toys were not as lavish, they were nice, but they couldn't compare with the princess doll. And even among these, Alberto could afford very little. He pointed to plastic babies, rubber dogs, and boxes with construction sets, but each time, the shopkeeper would shake her head regretfully. Finally, she laid out in front of the bewildered Alberto the things his scant savings could buy. The selection was not lavish, a jumping rope, a rubber ball, a crooked teddy bear with rather unfriendly eyes, and a small plastic airplane of burgundy color. It was the airplane that Alberto decided to settle for. Of course, Angelo was a girl and might have preferred a more girly toy. But not long ago, she had heard the story of the little prince and the pilot, told by a neighbor boy who had just read the tale in school. Angelo was incredibly taken with the beautiful story, and the airplane was like one of the characters from that tale. Surely, the toy would delight her, even if it wasn't a doll in a fancy dress. Now, many years later, Alberto was thankful to fate for giving him the chance to surprise his sister. He had managed to make Angela happy, to show his love and care. Surely, she remembered his gifts to this day. After all, it was the first celebration of her birthday. They split the pastry between the two of them, as usual, and the airplane. Angela had threaded a string through it and wore it as a charm. This is the little prince's friend, the aviator's plane. It will be my talisman. Thank you so much. You found a truly valuable thing. This plane is magical. Alberto was proud that he had managed to host a celebration for his beloved sister. Angelo was joyful. Her smile was the best reward for the boy, and she really liked his gift. Of course, the plane was in no way magical, even at five years old, Alberto understood this. But the important thing was that his sister was happy. She wouldn't even part with her charm at night. She would sleep with the plane around her neck. A little later, the children realized big changes were coming. Camillo was soon to leave for a work shift. Until then, he planned to move his new family to his city, into his apartment. The move. Alberto was used to shuffling around rooms with his mother. It was even interesting, there was always the hope that things would be better in the new place. Now, he wanted to see Camillo's city, to see his large cozy apartment, which he had often spoken about. But Angela, for some reason, was afraid of changes, she said she had some bad premonitions. The stories about the boy Luchik and the girl Smashinka became very sad. Now, constant troubles befell the heroes. Angela expressed her fears through creativity. Now, Alberto understood, the little girl was trying to cope with the anxiety on her own. Poor little thing. And there was not a single person on earth who would have protected them then. At first, Alberto could not understand why his sister was so scared of moving. It turned out a little later that Angela was right. The changes really didn't promise her anything good. Alberto was the first to hear the talk that Camillo did not want to take Angela into his new life. It happened late at night. His sister was peacefully snoring on the couch. The boy was lying next to her, but could not fall asleep. He had a stomachache. His mother and Camillo were sitting in the kitchen. It seemed they were drinking something. The new husband allowed their mother to drink, but only under his supervision and in limited doses. He behaved with her as if she were a child, and she obeyed unquestioningly. This man was her lucky ticket, well-to-do, strong, decisive, with his own living space. It was simply a blessing that such a wonderful person paid attention to her. The woman was ready to do a lot for him. The move is coming soon, Camillo muttered in a half voice. You should start packing your things slowly, I guess. Why bother to pack? We barely have anything, one voice said. True enough. Once we arrive in my city, I'll buy the boy some new clothes and toys. 
We don't want the neighbors to think he's a ragamuffin, responded another. At these words, a pang of anxieties tightened around Alberto's heart. The boy? Is he the only one? What about Angela? Why hasn't he mentioned her? The boy thought aloud, struggling to catch every word of the adult conversation. Soon, he understood the situation. It was far worse than he could have ever imagined. Also, take care of the girl for once, continued Camillo. Perhaps, we could take her too? The mother suggested hesitantly. It was clear that this was not the first time she had brought it up. No, absolutely not. This is not up for discussion. She's mentally challenged. Children like that are more trouble than they're worth. They require attention, and as time passes, she'll grow up and become troublesome. I don't want to live under the same roof with a disturbed child. Oh, such bad luck, the mother sighed. Why is it like this? My son is healthy, but my daughter isn't. You should have drunk less, Camillo advised sternly. When we plan for our own, I won't let you near alcohol for half a year. Alberto lay on his couch, struggling to believe what he had just heard. So, they were taking him to a new life, but not Angela. Because she was supposedly disturbed? And where were they planning to leave his beloved elder sister? He soon learned the answer. First thing tomorrow, take the girl to the orphanage. Say that you're facing a difficult life situation and so on. You can handle the boy, but not both of them. Shed a tear if needed. All right, the mother agreed, but let's not do it tomorrow. Let's do it right before we move. And why is that? Camillo didn't understand. He was obviously eager to get rid of the girl as soon as possible. The boy will throw a fit. He'll pester us day and night. He loves his sister very much. If we give Angela away and leave immediately, everything will be new and unfamiliar. It'll distract him. Perhaps you're right. They didn't talk about it anymore that evening, but Alberto had heard enough. He looked at his sleeping sister and couldn't imagine life without her, without her smile, without her support and care, without the stories of the sunbeam boy and the laughing girl. He would do everything to ensure they also took Angela. He would beg, plead, demand, even try to teach Angela to read. He could already put letters into words. Let Camillo see that his sister isn't disturbed. She was just afraid of him, which was why their lessons had been so unsuccessful. Barely waiting for Angela to wake up, Alberto immediately told her everything he had learned. The girl covered her mouth with her hands, tears streaming down her face. I knew it. I knew this would happen. She sobbed. Camillo hates me. And mother doesn't care. She's only concerned about having money. We'll convince him. You'll see. Everything will be okay. Alberto tried to soothe his sister and himself. The children tried. They really did. Alberto taught his sister the alphabet, but he wasn't making any progress. Angela was again not in the right state to absorb new knowledge. She was in a rush, scared, and became upset at the smallest failure. The brother and sister started behaving like perfect children. They made no noise, obeyed the adults at a half glance, and tried not to bother them or attract attention. Angela started making Camillo butter or sausage sandwiches in the morning. Their mother smiled as she watched this, but Camillo accepted the little girl's offering as his due, as though she was obliged to serve him. To Alberto, it seemed everything was going according to plan. His mother looked cheerful, Camillo satisfied. We're doing great, we're succeeding, he would tell his sister. She would smile and nod in response. Her charming smile, which always brought warmth and calm to Alberto, started appearing on her face again but it turned out all their efforts were in vain. On the eve of the move, Alberto overheard another conversation between the adults. It happened accidentally again. The boy entered the room without knocking because the door was unlocked. He simply went unnoticed. That's it, our flight is tomorrow at 1 p.m. In the morning, you take the girl to the children's home. All right. Alberto stormed into the kitchen and threw a real tantrum. He screamed, begged, called names, everything at once. He even smashed a couple of plates on the floor. 
Suddenly, Alberto found himself in the strong grip of Camillo. The boy struggled, tried to break free, but the man was stronger, much stronger. He shook the boy a few times, then stared into his eyes. Oh, how angry and irritated that gaze was. Alberto understood, at that moment, nothing in the world would have pleased Camillo more than to hit him. The man was barely restraining himself. Calm down, pup, his stepfather hissed. Or we might just send you to the children's home as well. You're too bold. You're like your older sister, aren't you? Same jeans. Give me away then. Alberto suddenly agreed. Send me to the children's home too. I'd rather live there, with Angela. Only thing is, you'd be in different groups, Camillo smirked. Different buildings. They're on opposite ends of the city, so you won't see each other anyway. I hate you. Alberto shouted, trying to wriggle and bite his tormentor. That's why I didn't want to tell him ahead of time, the mother apologized, spreading her hands helplessly. Mom. The desperate boy turned to the woman without much hope. Tell him we won't give Angela away. Please. She's ours, our own, our beloved. He's the stranger. My sweet boy, she really will be better off there. The children's home has treatment and educators who know how to deal with people like her, with the abnormal. She's normal. Alberto tried to reach the adults. Get rid of this one too, the stepfather growled, throwing the boy against the wall. It hurt, but Alberto's tears weren't because of the pain. That's when Angela entered the room with a loaf of bread in her hands. They had sent her to the shop. The girl came back to find her brother sobbing against the wall, her mother looking guilt-ridden and confused, her stepfather fuming with anger, and suddenly she fainted the child's body couldn't handle such strain. After all, the girl had been living in a state of fear and hope for a long time. The mother rushed to her daughter, picked her up, and moved her to the couch. See, I told you, she's sick. Camillo spat. Epileptic. And this one's a mental case too. Either you put them in the children's home today, or I fly off alone tomorrow. The man slammed the door and left the apartment. The mother took the dazed Alberto and the barely recovering Angela by their hands and led them outside. Where are we going? asked the girl. Perhaps this was her body's defensive reaction to forget the traumatizing conversation she had heard just a few minutes ago. We're going for a walk, the mother responded in an unusually soft and gentle voice. They're taking us to the children's home, Alberto reminded grimly. Both of us now. We'll live in different buildings, but at least in the same city. You'll be nearby, Angela smiled. This news seemed to encourage the girl. She gently touched the airplane pendant that always hung around her neck. First, the mother admitted Angela to the children's home and kissed her goodbye. It was evident that she was sad to part with her daughter, but not enough to go against Camillo's wishes. I'll be close by, Alberto told his sister. In a different building. We'll probably see each other, I guess. I hope so. I'll ask to visit you, Alberto pledged, his young voice filled with determination. And when I grow up, rich and strong, we'll live happily. I'll buy us a big house, and you, lots and lots of beautiful dolls. I can't wait, Angela smiled through her tears. The siblings embraced one last time before Angela was taken away. Alberto thought that his mother would now take him to the orphanage too, but instead they returned home. Why did you bring me here? The boy was puzzled. When are we going to the orphanage? Tomorrow, his mother evaded. That building is closed today. Her excuse seemed believable, plausible. But Alberto never went to the orphanage. Instead, he left with his mother and Camillo for a new, bigger city. It turned out that Camillo had a change of heart. He had always wanted a son, so it was decided that Alberto should stay with the family. The boy screamed, protested, yearned for his sister. But what could a five-year-old do against two adults? Eventually, Alberto gave in. The guilt of breaking his promise to his sister gnawed at him. It wasn't his fault, but that didn't make it any easier. Now Angela would think her brother had betrayed her. 
Alberto was sure that when he grew up, he would find Angela, and they would be happy together. Camillo did indeed have a spacious, beautiful apartment. Alberto even had his own room. Camillo tried to raise the boy, tried to be a figure of influence, spending time with him, but it was fruitless because Alberto hated this man, the cause of his separation from his sister. And then his mother went back to her old ways. She had already played the obedient, dutiful wife for too long. When Camillo was away, his mother would revert to her heavy drinking. She quickly found new friends in the new city, and everything went back to the way it used to be, only now Angelo wasn't around, and Alberto had to deal with his fears alone. Camillo didn't tolerate this for long. One day he simply kicked them both out onto the street. They stayed with one of his mother's friends for a while, until she found another suitor who took them in. The mother-son duo didn't stay with him for long either. The woman had another affair. Alberto once again roamed from apartments to corners. Periodically, his mother would temporarily leave him in a social shelter. There, he lived a quiet, contented life. It was the staff of such an institution who eventually enrolled him in school when the time came. Alberto enjoyed learning, but it was problematic to do homework on the window sill in the room, where a boisterous party was underway, filled with loud laughter and profanity. By the time Alberto was in fifth grade, his mother once again had a serious suitor in her life. Edgar worked in construction and often traveled for work. At first, Alberto was wary of a repeat of the Camillo episode, but this new man in his mother's life was a very different person, kind, reliable, and understanding. From the very start, Edgar was sympathetic to Alberto, accepting him as he was. He devoted a lot of attention to the boy, teaching him to cook, sharing stories from his own childhood, taking him fishing. Alberto relished these wonderful moments. Never before had an adult been so kind to him. With Edgar, his mother transformed, she stopped drinking, she found work as a cleaner. And these changes didn't come about from coercion or threats, like with Camillo. The woman herself wanted to improve, to make amends, to create a stable family. One day, Alberto mustered the courage. It had been six years since Angelo was sent to the orphanage. But not a day had gone by that he hadn't thought of his sister. Mom, let's go back for Angela. Edgar is so good, he will surely accept her as his own, and we will be happy. I've already called the orphanage, the woman confessed. I lost my rights to her, and she's been adopted by someone else. So there's nothing we can do, son. Tears welled up in Alberto's eyes. He had so hoped that everything would now be fine. I will find her anyway, when I grow up. I'm so sorry, his mother shook her head. I only understand now the mistake I made back then. Alberto grew up, graduated from school, and went to university. Thanks to Edgar, he had a normal childhood. Like any typical kid, he did his homework at his desk in his room and went to school events. Friends would visit him, and he was often invited to birthday parties. Alberto played in a football club and was passionate about model aviation. He tried to push away thoughts of his past life, but the horrific scenes occasionally haunted him in his dreams, unfamiliar faces of people, swearing, loud laughter, and Angela crying. His mother was now very quiet and caring, but resentment towards her still lived in Alberto's heart. How could she betray her daughter for the sake of her suitor? and him as well. The boy found it hard to forgive his mother for his difficult childhood and the separation from the person closest to him. Of course, as he grew older, he tried to find his sister, journeyed back to that orphanage, but he uncovered nothing. It turned out that his mother had lost parental rights to the girl. Angelo was already being prepared for adoption, for which they had changed her name and surname. But then something went awry, and the adopting family rejected the child. Later, Angelo was transferred to another facility because she began to have health problems. Where exactly she went, the records hadn't been preserved. It happens that way sometimes. The trail of his sister was lost, but Alberto didn't give up. He even hired a private detective with the money he earned from a summer job on a construction site. But this hope too proved fruitless. 
In desperation, he participated in an episode of a special TV program where people searched for their relatives. In addition to that, he plastered announcements all over the city where he and Angela had been separated. There were calls after that. Compassionate people, having learned of the touching story, sincerely wanted to help, but all leads turned out to be false. Eventually, Alberto decided to forget about Angela. He had tried to find his sister for a long time, and each new disappointment was increasingly hard to bear. It's very difficult to wait, hope, and then realize you've been following a false lead once again. Then Selena entered his life quiet, gentle, loving, touching. The young people got married. Alberto relished his family happiness and dreamt of having children. If only they could have a girl resembling Angela. But it turned out that Selena had serious health problems that prevented them from becoming parents. A long course of treatment began, endless trips to doctors. Selena held on to hope and, each time she realized that nothing had worked again, she became upset. Alberto understood her very well. He knew how hard it was when expectations were repeatedly unfulfilled. He felt sorry for his beloved, but how could he help her? One day, a seemingly wonderful idea occurred to him to adopt a girl from an orphanage. He had broken his promise to his sister. He had not taken her out of the orphanage. But they could still make another child happy, a child left without parental warmth and attention and everyone would be better off. His wife would finally get the long-awaited daughter. He could at least partially atone for his guilt towards his sister, and a child would find a family. But Selena didn't accept this idea. She dreamt of having their own child, one who would resemble both her and Alberto. The man respectfully accepted her decision. After all, it's a serious step, and one should not push. And now, this strange call from Selena... She was shouting over the phone that they urgently needed to go through foster parent training and gather documents from a list because a son was waiting for them in the orphanage. Their son. Now, Alberto sat at his desk, trying to make sense of what he had heard. Why had his wife's opinion changed? After all, she was categorically against taking in a child that wasn't their own. She spoke about the power of genes, about the hopelessness of children born to alcoholics. And now, such fervor. She promised to send a photograph of the boy. The phone chimed. A message from Selena had arrived. Alberto opened it and was stunned. The picture was of a six-year-old boy, unbelievably similar to both him and Angela. What a coincidence. The same gray-green eyes, the same upturned nose, and even the same birthmark on the cheek, just like his and his sister's. Selena was right. This was undeniably their child, and he had no place in an orphanage. However, the man tried to suppress his emotions. They needed to find out more about this boy first. They needed to meet him. First impressions can sometimes be misleading, and it would be unwise to make long-term plans based on them alone. The paperwork and foster parent training were completed in the shortest possible time. Just two weeks later, Selena and Alberto were ready to meet their potential foster son. During this time, his wife almost daily called the orphanage, inquiring about the boy's health, asking whether he had been taken by a family. Selena was very afraid that someone else would adopt the child before they could, as there was always a long line for such wonderful children healthy, strong, smart. The only disadvantage that reduced the demand for Domingo was his age. People typically preferred to adopt very young children, not older preschoolers. And now, finally, a meeting was scheduled. Tomorrow, they would travel to a neighboring city to meet the boy. On the eve of the meeting, both spouses were very anxious about how it would go, how the boy would receive them, what they should talk about to win his favor. Alberto and Selena were sitting in the playroom of the orphanage. For the moment, they were alone. The couple sat on a soft sofa by the window. Shelves lined with toys and books stood against the walls, a place that occupied the far corner. Cute little tables with tiny chairs were scattered throughout the spacious room. The children must enjoy spending time in this cozy place. The room resembled a typical daycare room, but the children playing here would not be picked up by their parents in the evening. These were children deemed unwanted by their own parents. 
There shouldn't be any orphans in the world, Selena mused, looking around the room. It's wonderful here, of course, but also terrible. I can only imagine how unhappy these little ones must feel. Maybe they don't know any other life, Alberto replied. Then, scenes from his own childhood emerged in his memory, and he added, it's not out of the question that this place seems like paradise compared to what they've seen at home. Soft footsteps were heard beyond the door. It was him. The couple exchanged a glance. A skinny, slightly anxious boy entered the room, taut as a bowstring. Messy chestnut hair, attentive eyes, a slightly upturned nose dotted with freckles, just as he was in the picture. But the photo didn't capture the most important things, his gestures, his walk, his facial expressions. More and more, Alberto saw himself and his sister in this boy. The boy met his gaze. A genuine interest flickered in the child's eyes. They, at least, had seen Domingo in a photograph, but this was the boy's first sight of his potential adoptive parents. And then the boy smiled. When he did, charming dimples appeared on his cheeks, just like Angela's. Alberto smiled back. He had already understood, his heart now irrevocably belonged to this little human. He would take him from here and make the boy's life happy and carefree, becoming the father that any child could only dream of. Selena, too, was looking at Domingo with admiration. It was clear that the boy had made an impression on her. Hello, Domingo was the first to break the prolonged silence. I like you. I can tell you're good people. Really now? The caregiver who had entered with the boy exclaimed, throwing her hands up in a comical gesture. Alberto and Selena only noticed her now. Their attention had been entirely focused on the child. Finally. So, you're not even going to pretend to be difficult? Nope, the boy shook his head and took a step closer to the visitors. Many people wanted to take this boy home, the caregiver explained to the adults, but he was having none of it. He didn't like anyone, and that was that. No amount of persuasion worked. And just to make sure, Domingo would throw spectacular tantrums in front of potential adopters. I'm good at that, the little boy nodded. Don't get the wrong idea, he's a very intelligent and agreeable child. It's just that, well, he was somehow filtering out parents who for some reason he didn't like. Other children dream of a family, but this one. I was waiting for you, Domingo finished for her. And we've been searching for you all this time. Selena couldn't resist any longer and embraced the boy, despite having been warned to keep her emotions in check during the first meeting. Alberto couldn't tear his eyes away from the boy. He knelt in front of him and closely examined every feature of his face. How did it happen that the child resembled him and Angela so much? The caregiver had noticed this too. Domingo really does look like his dad, she exclaimed in surprise. That's a good sign. When can we take our son home? Asked Alberto. Well, I think you can pick him up first thing tomorrow morning, replied the caregiver. Given how well things are going, Domingo will have a talk with the psychologist today, but it's a formality. I can already see that he has accepted you. We just need to prepare the paperwork. We'll have everything done by the evening. Come for your treasure in the morning. I will be waiting for you eagerly, confessed Domingo. I like you so much. We will be happy, very, very happy, you will see, I know it, Alberto responded. You are probably the little prince who's meant to save me, only you're all grown up now. What? Alberto didn't understand. Domingo has such an imagination. The caregiver chuckled. And he's very smart. He's already a voracious reader. He reads a lot of fairy tales, then invents his own. Sometimes he comes up with things that amaze us all. Some even call him our little Anderson. He invents fairy tales? Alberto turned to the boy. About whom? About different characters. Right now, about the little prince. And you. Have you read the book about him? Yes, a long time ago, when, when mom, when she used to bring me books. Alberto's heart clenched at the change in Domingo's expression when he remembered his mother. 
To distract the boy a bit, he asked a question, not really expecting a correct answer. Do you know who wrote the story of the little prince? Of course. The French writer and aviator Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Alberto and Selena exchanged surprised glances. I told you, Domingo is very clever. The caregiver beamed proudly. Later, when Domingo had gone to the dining hall, the woman shared some interesting information with the boy's soon-to-be parents. At last, he showed his true self. You wouldn't believe what he used to do in front of potential parents, throwing tantrums, faking some sort of fits, doing everything in his power to make himself unlikable. Of course, people were afraid to take such a peculiar child and left empty-handed. Why did he do that? Selena inquired. He later explained that he didn't like the parents. He claimed he was good at reading people, insisted he would be unhappy with them. It was heartbreaking. The little one didn't realize he was condemning himself to a life in the orphanage. So, it turns out, he likes us? Alberto sought confirmation. From the first glance, the woman replied. As soon as he saw you, he just lit up. I could feel it. I'm glad for both of you, and for the boy, of course. You and Domingo are sure to be happy together. The next day, Selena and Alberto were ready to go to the orphanage as early as 6 in the morning, but they had to wait until 10. That's when the director would return from his scheduled meeting. The couple spent the remainder of the previous day and almost the whole night talking about Domingo. He's so intelligent. Selena marveled. And so charming. We're lucky that no one took him before us. Yes, indeed, Alberto chuckled. The boy put quite an effort, judging by what the caregiver told us. The couple joyfully planned their future life, now as a trio. They considered where to go on vacation, where to take their son out for weekend trips, what meals to cook to make sure he'd love them. Selena dreamed of taking her son shopping and buying him loads of stylish, beautiful clothes so that he'd look like the boys from fashion magazines. Alberto searched for information about teaching children to play chess. Something told him that the clever Domingo would be drawn to this ancient game. Both spouses understood at that moment the boy was already making them happier. Everything would only get better and more interesting from here. Life was infused with new colors. At exactly 10 in the morning, Alberto and Selena were already standing at the director's office door. Who could doubt your eagerness? The man who had just returned from the meeting noted cheerfully. Please, come in. The necessary paperwork was signed. The official conversation was held. It took no more than half an hour, but during those 30 minutes, Selena constantly glanced at her watch. She felt that Domingo must be waiting impatiently for them and might even be thinking that they had changed their minds. Therefore, she wanted to finish the bureaucratic formalities as soon as possible and see their son. Alberto was experiencing the same feelings, only he was better at keeping them in check. Finally, the caregivers brought Domingo into the office. The women were smiling happily. Some even dabbed their eyes with handkerchiefs. The staff always rejoiced when another abandoned child found a new family. Be happy, our clever boy, one of the nannies hugged her favorite charge and planted a loud kiss on his cheek. He smiled back at her a little sheepishly and immediately shifted his gaze to his new parents. Selena was the first to break. She darted to the boy, embraced him, took his hand. Alberto also approached his son, ruffling his chestnut hair with a tender swipe of his hand. And that's when he noticed it up close, a tiny, burgundy airplane on a string. Just like Angela once had, the boy wore this handmade trinket around his neck. It took every ounce of restraint Alberto had not to pepper the boy with questions. The child was already nervous enough, he didn't need to be unsettled any further, and the watchful eyes of the orphanage staff were still upon them. They might doubt his sanity and decide not to hand over the boy. No, he would certainly find out everything, but later. The boy needed time to adjust. All the way home, Alberto thought about that airplane, mechanically answering his wife's questions, even joking with her and Domingo, but his eyes kept straying to the rearview mirror, where he could see the boy and his necklace. 
The toy plane looked just like the one from his own distant childhood, the one little Alberto had gifted his sister, Angela. Of course, many years had passed, and he could easily be mistaken, but there were just too many coincidences, the boy from the orphanage who looked so strikingly like him, and now this airplane, all of it seemed too fortuitous to be random. The apartment greatly appealed to little Domingo, and his own room was an absolute delight. The couple had made every effort to prepare a perfect room for their long-awaited son. The walls were adorned with fresh, space-themed wallpaper, a sports complex was tucked away in one corner, and under the window stood the dream of every boy, a car-shaped bed with headlight nightlights. Selena had poured her heart into creating a space that would captivate Domingo, and she hit the mark, the boy's eyes glowed with genuine admiration. He was particularly drawn to a bookshelf. Over time, the couple had gradually collected a children's library. Sometimes, when they saw a beautiful book with bright illustrations, they couldn't resist and bought it for the future. And now, at last, that future had arrived. Domingo scanned the book titles with a hungry eye, his face growing happier by the second. The couple had lucked out in this regard too. They had found a child who, like them, loved to read. Then there was a festive dinner, ordered from a restaurant. Selena, of course, wanted to cook something herself, but Alberto told her that there would be plenty of time to impress their son with her culinary talents, and now she needed to rest the day had been demanding. After dinner, Domingo wanted to sleep immediately. This happy day, full of bright impressions and discoveries, had exhausted him too. His new mom and dad tucked him into bed and read him a bedtime story. Domingo fell asleep with a smile on his face. He didn't take off the tiny airplane necklace. When Selena tried to do this, the boy stopped her. No, don't, it protects me, he said, echoing his mother's words. It's, um, a talisman, yes. It's the very same plane from the little prince, understand? I understand, Selena nodded seriously. Then, of course, we shouldn't take it off. I knew you would understand, you're smart, proclaimed Domingo, and almost instantly fell into a deep sleep. Selena and Alberto sat in the kitchen for a long time afterwards, talking. Tell me in more detail about how our boy ended up in the orphanage, the man requested. But I already told you, Selena shrugged. I know, I know, I just want to hear it again to make sure I understood everything correctly. All right. Domingo was born to a single woman, a former orphanage graduate. The boy was raised without a father. His mother raised him alone. I believe she worked as a cook in a student cafeteria. By all accounts, she was a very good and positive woman, without bad habits, devoted to her child. And it shows, doesn't it? After all, who else could have taught him to read? And Domingo is very intelligent for his age. He has clearly been well-educated. And then... Then disaster struck. Domingo's mother was hit by a drunk driver in a pedestrian crossing, leaving the boy all alone in the world. He had no other family, so he ended up in the orphanage. There, psychologists worked with him to help him come to terms with his loss. By the way, their work isn't quite finished yet, so we'll continue in our local pediatric clinic. I've never told you about this, or anyone else for that matter. It was too painful, Alberto finally confessed. But today, this little airplane. I just can't understand what's going on. And Alberto told his wife the story of his troubled childhood and the lost sister, not forgetting to mention the little burgundy plastic airplane. Selena sat, covering her mouth with her hand. Tears flowed down her cheeks, but she didn't even notice. How could this be, she finally uttered. How hard it must have been for you and your sister. So that's why you harbor such resentment towards our mother? I just couldn't understand it. Yes, she was an alcoholic, but she never abandoned you. So why such coldness towards her? Now it all makes sense. That's all nonsense, Alberto dismissed. What I'm interested in now is whether the airplane is just a coincidence or whether Domingo really is Angela's son, which means he's my nephew. If that's the case, I don't know whether to rejoice or not. 
On one hand, it's a blessing to know for sure that I'm raising Angela's son to atone in some way for my guilt towards my sister. On the other hand, if Domingo is her child, then Angela is definitely no longer alive. Her life didn't pan out happily. She grew up in the orphanage. She wasn't taken in by a kind, wealthy family like I dreamed for her when we were children. Alberto, what guilt are you talking about? Selena exclaimed in surprise. You were just a toddler when it all happened, and then you tried to find Angela, but it was too late. All traces had been lost. You're certainly not to blame for this. It doesn't matter, Alberto shook his head. The most important thing was to find out whether Domingo was truly his nephew or not. We will find out. We'll do a DNA test, and that will tell us the truth. Though, we'll need to raise some money, the test isn't cheap. I'll pick up some extra work. I've been meaning to anyway. Months passed. Domingo settled into the family completely and made friends in the neighborhood. He loved to read, drew a lot, and his drawings were beautifully detailed. He joined a chess club where Alberto had enrolled him. Moreover, the boy tried to help his parents in every way possible, washing dishes, dusting, always tidying his room without being reminded. With each passing day, Alberto noticed more and more how much the boy resembled both himself and Angela. Just like Alberto's sister, the boy would furrow his eyebrows when trying to understand something, gesticulate amusingly with his hands, and even laughed in the same hearty way as Angela once did. And Domingo was a storyteller. Selena diligently wrote down every one of his tales in a thick notebook. She said she would take these stories to a publisher and they would make a wonderful book. Domingo was thrilled with the idea. And the airplane, the boy never parted with this toy, even carrying it with him outdoors. The neighborhood children quickly picked up the trend, and soon they too were parading around the yard with various plastic figurines around their necks. Alberto was saving money on a special account necessary for the DNA test. Of course, he could take a loan and find out the truth right away, but he deliberately postponed this moment. The result frightened him. He didn't understand what he wanted to hear. Selena's birthday was approaching. Domingo was clearly preparing a painting as a gift for her. He would lock himself in his room and draw for hours, and if someone came in, he would hastily cover his creation with his hand. It's so heartwarming, Selena once told her husband. Domingo is trying so hard. This will be the most precious gift I've ever received for my birthday. And on the festive morning, when Selena and Alberto were still in bed, Domingo made a ceremonious entrance into the room. In his hands, he held a beautiful, vibrant drawing. It depicted a boy, all golden and radiant, and a red-haired girl smiling from ear to ear. That's wonderful, my boy. Selena embraced him. I love this drawing so much. Thank you very much. Tell me, who are the people in the drawing? The boy climbed into bed with her and started to explain. This boy is Beam, and this is his sister, Giggles, the young boy began, pointing to the bright drawing that seemed to vibrate with life. They're always having adventures, some of them even dangerous. But they're smart, brave, and stick together, so everything always ends well. Oh, how fascinating, Selena replied, a warm smile dancing on her lips as she stroked her son's back. We have a true storyteller in our family. Alberto was stunned. A chill ran down his spine and a buzzing filled his ears. This couldn't be a mere coincidence. The physical similarities between Domingo and Angela were one thing. The toy airplane was another, a potent yet uncertain piece of the puzzle. But these characters, the boy Beam and girl Giggles, they were unmistakably Angela's creations. They were the protagonists of the stories that Angela used to invent, the adventures she conjured up, and the narratives that a young Alberto had once listened to with wide-eyed fascination, begging his sister to tell him more. These aren't my stories, Domingo confessed. They were, my mom made them up and told me about them. She said that Giggles and Beam lived on a cloud and were friends with a little prince, and that one day the prince would come in this airplane, the one I always wear around my neck and rescue us, me and my mom. And the prince did come, but my mom's not here anymore. 
Selena hugged the young boy. He tried not to mention his mother, but Selena, with her tender heart and perceptive mind, understood his need to speak about her and his past. She was always ready to lend a patient ear. You're my mom now, of course, Domingo said, rewarding Selena with a warm smile. But she was my mom too. Of course, of course, Selena agreed, her voice a comforting murmur. You must tell us about her whenever you want. It's important. Do you know what I've decided? Alberto suddenly announced, grinning at his son and wife. We're about to go on vacation soon. We should all go to the seaside together. Domingo, I bet you've never seen the sea before, have you? No, Domingo confessed, his eyes wide with anticipation. But I really, really want to. Well, that settles it then, Alberto decided. Now we just need to plan the trip. It's a serious task, but a delightful one too. Hooray! Domingo cheered, his laughter bouncing off the walls. But what about the money? Selena asked in a whisper. Alberto just winked at her, his smile carefree. There was money for the trip, money that had been put aside for the DNA test. Alberto didn't need the test anymore. It was clear to him now, without a shred of doubt, that Domingo was Angela's son. He intended to give the boy a life full of happiness and carefree days, an opportunity to explore and grow his numerous talents. Once, he had wanted to surround his sister with the same love and attention, but failed. Now, fate had granted him a second chance in the form of this boy, his nephew. And Alberto was determined not to let this chance slip away. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.